I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We're located on the web at warscholar.org and militaryhistorypodcast.com. Thank you. I'm speaking with Dr. Konstantin Vaporis, author of Samurai, an Encyclopedia of Japan's Cultured Warriors. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for inviting me to uh, speak with you and your uh, audience. So first, um, tell me how you got into um, studying and writing a book on this subject. Well, my, my interest in the samurai and my interest in Japan kind of go hand in hand. And that goes all the way back to middle school when uh, I began studying Japanese language and uh, going to uh, Japanese film festivals in Boston where I uh, grew up. So at a, in the 1970s, so at a, a pretty young age, I was, uh, already well versed in all the samurai classics of, uh, Chambara, the samurai films, the mm-hmm. uh, Seven Samurai and Samurai Rebellion, Harakiri and, and so forth. So I went on to, to major in Japanese language in college and then, uh, grad school, um, focusing on East Asian history and Japan in particular and, but I began to write seriously about um, samurai for my second book, uh, which is called, uh, rather long title, but uh, Tour of Duty, uh, Samurai Military Service in Edo mm-hmm. and the Culture of Early Modern Japan. Mm-hmm. So in that book, I was really interested in um, the individual experiences of the samurai who were serving their military lords or daimyo and, uh, and it, uh, accompanying them on their uh uh, required attendance on the shogun in the capital city of Edo. Um, so I was writing about their personal experiences. Mm. And so after that, I started writing, working on a collection of biographies of uh, samurai. Uh, when I saw a query uh, from an editor at uh, ABC Clio who was looking for someone to write an encyclopedia of the samurai, I wasn't intending to write one and um in, in a way, I, I, it was a little bit reluctant because it was a huge project. And uh, so it, it took me away from what I had originally started uh, for a period of three years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I wanted to do it because I wasn't happy with the kind of books that um, are out there on the samurai and thought I you know, could do it a good job. Mm-hmm. I noted this book has um, fantastic reviews right now um, or it has fantastic reviews, so I'm really glad we could uh, discuss it, since it seems to be filled with um, Thank a you. lot of interesting information. Plus, I noted, I guess you're associated with Smithsonian uh, Journeys. You give tours in Japan. I, is that correct? I, I give lectures on the tours. Um, hmm. Right. Okay. Um, so, then, with that said, um, I also noted in the introduction to the book that uh, you mentioned there's a lot more to be written um, a lot more than that then can fit in the one volume. So, sure. so tell me, how did you, um, figure out the date ranges you wanted to focus on? And with all the material, um, that there is, how did you narrow all that down within the date ranges you picked? Sure. That's a good question. And that was the major challenge of the book, which could have easily been at least double the size. Um, well, my, my main interest is in the samurai during the Tokugawa or early modern period, mm-hmm. uh, rather than in the period of civil war that preceded uh, six, the year 1600, the roughly century-long period of civil war. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was a period in which the samurai as a, a distinct status group became fixed. Um, and it's also, you know, for me, the most interesting period for a lot of the um you know, in, in, in the sense that d- during this period that the samurai go through great transformations as a warrior elite in a uh, time of extended peace. So um, so that's why I picked that time period. And it's the one I've been writing about now for, um, you know, 30, 30 years. And for listeners, what exact uh, years are we talking about? So uh, formally, the Tokugawa period is uh, the reign of the Tokugawa shoguns from 1603 until 1868. So then having, you know, narrowed the, or selected a, a time period, I then had the challenge of um, what, what to include, what to leave out. So my, 
my my interest is um, I felt like a lot of the books that were out there on the samurai tend to focus on martial arts or on the philosophy of the samurai and um, and and again to focus on either the period uh, of civil war before the Tokugawa period or the last few decades when Japan was again rife with um, you know political turmoil. Mm-hmm. But as a result, the you know more than two centuries of of peace in between tends to get left out. So I was interested in telling the story of sort of what 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 the what the samurai were like in ordinary times. Mm-hmm. So given that it's an encyclopedia, you know, obviously the attempt was to be encyclopedic, mm-hmm. um, but given the constraints of page length, I had to make some difficult choices. So I selected certain categories, uh, people, material culture, and the practices of the samurai, mm-hmm. the kinds of groups and organizations that they formed, um, important events, which, which are mainly uh, battles, uh, few though they were during this time. Um, I, I also picked um, texts, you know, texts that were written about the samurai or by samurai during uh, the, the Tokugawa years. Mm-hmm. And um, also had a section on uh, documents. So, you know, I easily could have, uh, as I said, d- doubled the length of it. But um, I had to make difficult choices. And, and in line with sort of the, the focus of the book, which um, was to emphasize the, the samurai not as simply a, a warrior, but um, as a cult- cultured elite. Mm-hmm. In fact, the, the original placeholder title selected by the editor was... Uh, Samurai Japan's fiercest warriors, which which I thought I mean I, was understandable, but kind of played to the sort of the the, um, the popular image and cliche of the samurai as, as just a warrior mm-hmm. fixated on death and dying and um, kind of a un- unidimensional figure. Mm-hmm. So I I wanted to emphasize the fact that samurai had to balance both the arts of war as well as the arts of peace, and so that's why I. Uh, selected the title that I did. Mm-hmm. Now, having um, I, I looked through some of the subject matter that the book touches on, so I'll ask a few questions based on uh, some of the things that mo- that I found most interesting that that uh, that were listed. Sure. So first, um, so to build on what you just said, considering that the samurai at this time were trained, you know, they were warriors but they were also the bureaucracy in a sense they ran right. the government um how how well could the government be run how efficiently and fairly could it be run when the people in charge were these these warriors you know with senses of honor and and um you know i, I don't know how much how much ego there went with running the government that sort of thing do you do you understand the question does it make sense? Sure. I mean, they, they, the samurai had a monopoly on the, the means of the, the use of weapons and the mean, means of violence. Uh, so, right. I mean, they, they, uh, at, at the same time were able to achieve what really hasn't been achieved elsewhere in world history. And that's, you know, almost two and a half centuries of, of peace. Um, you know, of course, there were social costs uh, to that, and I, I think that's what your question is getting at. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the the degree to which the samurai, you know, um, exercised authoritarian power, the degree to which they had to use violence or the threat of violence, you know, is is something that is um, de- de- debated and and talked about. So, were the I guess I'm trying to get a handle on how the bureaucracies were run. Was it samurai Mm -hmm. were in charge of maybe departments and commoners worked for them or how did, you know, what was the interplay? Cause I assume with this length of peace, um, there was all, all the mundane factors of, you know, agricultural production and distribution, um, port management roads, that sort of thing. Right. Well, um, since you mentioned the, the agriculture, um, I guess that, that's a good institution to, to look at sort of the interplay between samurai and non-samurai and the other rest of society, commoners, were, you know, formally divided into the peasant farmers, 
artisans and the merchants. The artisans and merchants lived in the city with, or to live in cities where samurai also resided. Mm -hmm. So in the end of the 16th century and beginning of the 17th century, um, the warlords, the daimyo, largely drew the samurai off the land. So it was a very, that meant that um, to a large extent, samurai had to rely on non-samurai, the commoners, to help administer um, to, to, to administer a agriculture, for example. So there was a close relationship between samurai government and the top echelon, um, the village uh, elite. In, in some cases, the village leaders were given essentially quasi-samurai status, per permission to uh, wear two swords like samurai and also to have a surname. Um, and so they acted as intermediaries between the village and the samurai government, which um, was, was, you know, a very top heavy kind of government. It didn't intrude very uh, deeply into the countryside. Mm -hmm. To to be a samurai, were, were, were people, were men born into it or could, could, could someone be elevated into the samurai class by some action or, or so, some other way? Right. So that's with the Tokugawa period, the status becomes formalized and hereditary. Mm -hmm. So before 1600, um, the definition of a samurai was pretty loose. And, you know, anyone that, you know, pick, picked up a sword and was skilled in, in warfare might uh, be able to achieve, um, you know, to find a lord to attach himself to and become a samurai in that fashion. But from the 17th century on, it largely it becomes a hereditary status. Now, some people are able to get some of the, uh, some non-samurai are able to acquire some of the uh, perquisites or privileges of samurai status. As I mentioned, the uh, uh, village elite um, were allowed to, to wear two swords and have a surname, um, but, but they really weren't considered uh, samurai. Mm -hmm. Similarly, some foreigners um, early in the period uh, who became advisors, for example, to the first uh, shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu, uh, were, were given certain um, the, uh, the rights to to have uh, to bear arms, and so. But these these people kind of occupy a um, kind of quasi um, samurai uh, status, and, and late in the period, the um, samurai who are rather impoverished, the government um, sell the rights. Um, to um, so, some of the rights to samurai status to wealthy merchants, hmm. and and so that gave some of those merchants some status, but but they never became part of the government administrative machinery. So it was a kind of honorary status. I noticed one comment, and you mentioned it here already. Um, how uh, there wasn't the sense of loyalty among samurai to their lords before this period, but after it was almost like formalized and forced, like loyalty became a, a virtue. Um, right. And I wonder how much that was developed in order to maintain uh, the peace that existed. You know, it seems like it, it, it hardened into a very um, formalized structure where you had codes of conduct which you had to adhere to. Otherwise, I guess you were punished or... or Stripped of being a samurai, I don't know. It, it could be, depending on what action one one did. Sure, precisely. It um, that loyalty becomes uh, formalized, institutionalized in in large part because with the coming of peace, um, it wasn't possible for a warrior to change lords. Um, one had no choice but to serve a particular lord. So. Um, it's it the institutionalization of, of loyalty is kind of it's kind of ironic that it develops at a time when samurai really have no no choice um, but to follow a, a, a lord. Hmm. Whereas as you mentioned in the during the Civil War period, uh, when when the Jesuits were in Japan uh, in the mid 16th century, they they wrote about how uh, disloyal Japanese warriors were that they you know jumped from one lord to another and betrayed one another. Um, Killed, killed siblings, killed their parents uh, in order to to climb up the ladder. Wow. Um, so I imagine being being a warrior, samurai warrior, doesn't necessarily mean that you're also trained to um, lead lead armies. 
Um, so I'm curious, were, were there any samurai who are specifically focused on being uh, military leaders? And also, I'm, I'm curious about the Navy. Were there samurai who focused on developing and ma- maintaining ships or a fleet of any kind like this, anything like this? Sure. Um, that's a, a good question. The um, a, a administration of an individual daimyo, and there were about 260 of them, so their retainer band or retainer corps was divided in two. One was concerned with, you know, we might say governmental administration, and the other half was strictly military, um, uh, military hierarchy. So within that uh, military side of the retainer corps, there were, you know, people would specialize in um, certain military positions and functions. Uh, so there would be, um, you know, generals who would be, uh, in, in charge of leading portions of, uh, Daimyo's army. Uh, of course, it was largely a time of overwhelming peace. So, um, these armies didn't get to, uh, to, to actually, uh, weren't actually, uh, u- utilized. But your question about the Navy is interesting because, um, as, as you might know, after, um, the, the Japanese, uh, government excluded after they excluded the Portuguese and, uh, and Spanish, uh, early in the uh, 17th century, they began to restrict the construction of ocean going vessels. Um, and Japan, you know, is described by, um, many at this time as a kind of closed country. Uh, so, uh, the Navy, cer- certain daimyo maintained small navies, but they were, uh, generally, uh, ships of, uh, relatively modest um, capacity. Late in the period, though, when, um, you know, the Western powers start to pressure Japan, um, the many years of sort of lack of practical naval experience um, comes to haunt Japan. And so in the closing decades, a lot of the samurai activists uh, focus on building up a strong Japanese navy. Hmm. So it's just a small group. It's not necessarily sort of widespread interest in it. Well, those domains that faced the water um, obviously t- tended to have more of a an interest in in um, maintaining uh, uh, ships, mm-hmm. particularly those that were located at some distance from Edo, from the shogun's capital. Uh, they utilized uh, boats for a portion of the journey that they were required to make to Edo every other year, mm-hmm. but they were only allowed to go as far as Osaka in central Japan. And that's believe that there's nothing written that explains why that was the case, but generally it's believed that that was uh, for strategic defensive purposes. The shogun didn't want, you know, large numbers of ships um, with lo- potentially loaded with military men uh, coming to the capital. Hmm. That makes me think of the Rubicon in Rome, where you can't, you weren't allowed to bring troops past, you know, and of course Caesar crossed it. You know, sure. that civil war. Um, so, as far as the the troops they had, or or the, the their military ranks, were they filled by specialized soldiers, or did they train the the other non samurai uh, people to be ready for war? How, what was the interplay there? Uh, no, uh, the, the samurai. The, their the basis of their power lay in their monopoly on the, the right to bear arms, and they they. Pretty much je- jealously guarded that, mm-hmm. uh, pretty much you know, down to the end of the Tokugawa period. Mm-hmm. It was only after uh, the Americans and uh, began to pressure uh, Japan, and Japan felt in- inadequately prepared to meet the Western military threat, that in a few domains they begin to train um, uh, commoners, non-samurai, mm-hmm. to bear arms, but they always... Um, you know, control them. The the commanders of those units were always samurai. Mm-hmm. So before this period, were commoners used for fighting, and then they were sort of disarmed afterwards to maintain the peace? Because I imagine um, mm-hmm. it sounds like the armies or the the fighting groups were kind of small, and they didn't want to make them too big for whatever reason. Oh, uh, during what what period? What when are you talking about? Um... So both before this period that you're your book focuses on and then during 
Well, at, at the end of the 16th century, beginning of 17th century, the Daimyo were fielding large armies. Mm-hmm. Over 100,000 fought at the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. at the end of the 16th century, the scale of battle was getting larger and larger. Um, the muskets, of course, were introduced in the 1560s, which a- added to the, uh, you know, the carnage of, of, of warfare in a way that just uh, previously horseback um, you know, warriors on uh, horseback uh, was that kind of warfare was not as uh, lethal mm-hmm. as uh, when muskets were introduced. So I'm not sure if I answered your your question or not. So, so the so the, like Seki Gahara include. So did they arm commoners, or you're just saying that the the warrior class was just so large at this at this time that they were able to field armies this big? Right. Well, well, the sort of the, the boundaries, who was a samurai was not uh, entirely clear at that time. Hmm. Um, that, that slowly gets, um, the, the status becomes more fixed in the first decades of the 17th century. But yeah, so a broad range of people, um, I guess people that you would later call commoners were also, you know, employed in, in, um, positions to, to assist warriors and, act in a kind of supplementary capacity. Mm-hmm. So I guess I didn't realize there was such a sort of societal shift when the Tokugawa came in power that where, where a vast number of the populace was basically told, you're not going to be able, you're not going to fight anymore. We're in charge. You're not going to have weapons. You're not going to be trained to fight. Right. We have all the power. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? It's yes, and and so there was an attempt to um, a successful attempt to pacify the countryside by uh, requiring those who were going to take up arms and serve a lord to leave the countryside and move into the castle towns where the military lords or daimyo resided, and uh, the countryside thus was uh, removed of a for all intents and purposes of weapons and became you know, thereby it became easier to control and, and rule. So it is a major shift, uh, indeed. Hmm. So now it's sort of, I'm just kind of jumping, unfortunately jumping ahead uh, okay. past the period you cover. But then I see now, you know, just thinking about the um, Russo-Japanese War and then World War Two. you know, I guess they had to bring commoners back in and instill the warrior spirit to engage in sort of international warfare, so to speak. Right. Well, it, it took about a uh, decade, if you will, to un- unmake the samurai as a distinct status group mm-hmm. slowly. And, and I, I find that process really fascinating. Uh, like one of my entries in the book is um, unmaking the samurai, mm-hmm. for example, by um, prohibiting the distinctive uh, hairstyle, the top knot that samurai had, prohibiting their right to commit ritual suicide. Which when, when that was introduced, that, um, that, um, uh, uh, idea was introduced to the first Japanese diet. The man who made that proposal was actually, uh, assassinated. Hmm. Um, the, the right to conduct a, uh, legalized vendetta, um, the right to bear arms. All these rights were slowly taken away over the course of a period and, and samurai's, um, uh, stipends were also uh, in a step-by-step process, um, uh, taken away by, uh, the new Meiji government. And then all comp, then, uh, the right to bear arms became a requirement of all citizens of the new Japanese state after 1868. It no longer became the monopoly of a single, uh, elite group, the samurai. Wow, that's interesting. So considering, um, that they had that the samurai and daimyo had a monopoly on power. I was wondering if there was um, much sort of uh, did the did the peace have to be enforced much with violence, or was the pacification so complete that um, there wasn't much of that? You know, no rioting or you know citizens rioting or anything like that. Right. Good question. Well, there there were you know many incidences of. Uh, of peasant disturbances or peasant protest. Um, but, but given the fact that, you know, peasants didn't have uh, weapons, typically, um, they used more peaceful means of, uh, protest through formal petitions, 
or by threatening or actually fleeing from the domain and going over the border to the next domain, mm -hmm. which um, was terrible for the military lords, the daimyo, because it showed um, greatly concerned them because it showed that they weren't administering their domain properly and that would come to the attention of the shogun. Hmm. Typically, violence um, on the part of samurai didn't have to be used to uh, uh, to quell unrest, mm -hmm. but as there are many instances in which uh, samurai, in order to exercise their social privilege, uh, did use their weapons on commoners. Mm -hmm. Technically, the samurai had a right to kill a commoner uh, who was acting in an offensive manner. Mm -hmm. The reality is of it is, you know, not surprisingly much more uh, complicated. Mm -hmm. And because Japan was divided into so many, you know, 260 domains, it's it's hard to get an aggregate picture. But just to give you some sense, uh, there is one study where a scholar looked at the uh, over a period of almost a century the number of instances in which samurai drew their swords to uh, cut, to, to kill offending uh, commoners. And in one domain called Okayama, it occurred roughly once every six years. Because hmm. it sounds like the, the pe peasants could at least vote with their feet. If they felt abused or scared in one area, they could just move to another, another area and, and work there, work the land there. Right, well... Not not so easily done um, after you know 1600 and um, mo most peasant protest was to achieve certain goals either you know reduction in taxes or some tax relief during a period of drought mm -hmm. and so if, if a group of uh, peasants you know fled went into another domain um, and tried to come back. Um, Typically, you know, and their their requests were demands were granted. There would be a price to pay. Typically, the ringleaders, somebody was going to pay a price. Um, uh, oftentimes, the ringleader was was put to death, and only then, you know, were were demands acceded to. Mm. Okay, I'm sort of uh, so I noticed in the book one of the um, topics was uh, the mili the rules of the military household. I think it was, um, and. That sounded kind of fascinating. Can you is did I use the right phrase? And can you explain what that is? Right. Well, those were um, laws or um, legislation issued by the central government, that of the Tokugawa uh, shogun, referred to as the shogunate. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these were instituted for the the daimyo, and th these laws really didn't try and dictate how the daimyo ruled their own domains. They were pretty much left to their own devices as long as you know not they ruled wisely and didn't cause thousands of peasants to leave their domain and cause trouble over the border. Um, if they faithfully followed the rules of alternate attendance, you know, coming to Edo every other year. These laws were mainly dictated the or sought to regulate the personal behavior of daimyo, uh, not to to marry without the uh, permission of the the shogun, so as not to have uh, you know use marriage at, to forge political alliances, as was often the case before 1600. Mm -hmm. Th those laws were mainly, I would say, sum sumptuary in, in in nature, and they were reissued uh, periodically. Typically, every shogun, when he acceded uh, came to to power, would re reissue them, mm. and they changed uh, slightly, but, but not a great deal over over time. Mm -hmm. There's essentially a pledge of allegiance as well um, on the part of the daimyo to, you know, follow the, the shogun. Mm -hmm. I think I also saw it mentioned uh, comments about women eventually being trained in fighting to protect the household. Um, do I have that correct? And can you uh, talk about that? Sure. That always that topic always. Uh, understandably draws a lot of um, attention. Mm -hmm. There were certain certain domains that, that seemed to pride or value more the martial readiness or fitness of, of women. Mito domain, uh, Aizu domain in, in the north in particular is famous uh, where their women actually uh, fought 
in the wars in 1868 when the new imperial forces that would later become the Meiji government um, were, were attacking one of the few domains that were, remained loyal to the Tokugawa. And so it's a famous story of the women of Aizu Domain who actually fought against the imperial army. The women in the in, inner court of the shogun also um, trained some with um, uh, Naginata or the halberd. Mm-hmm. But but as a rule, uh, women belonging to the samurai uh, uh, status group weren't trained in, in, in martial arts. Mm-hmm. Now, I've... And this is maybe a little off topic, but um, I've heard about samurai fleeing to Thailand and setting up a, a co- community there at some point in Japanese history. Is that is that in the period before the encycl what the encyclopedia covers, or can, can you address that? Yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's in that trans transition, the end of the 16th century, um, when Japanese um, actually were quite mobile, unlike after. The 1630s, when Japanese were pretty much trapped on the home islands, um, and so yeah, there there, there was a there were, was a samurai who went uh, to Thailand and became an advisor, I believe, to the king there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were samurai who traveled to Southeast Asia and 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 so on to Vietnam mm-hmm. um, and so forth. Okay. Also, I, I get the sense that, uh, and maybe this is incorrect, but that the samurai were more attached. Their family name was more important than perhaps the specific land or castles that they were, um, that they lived on or in. Um, were they very attached to the land that their family had or could they be moved around? Right. Well, that, this is a uh, fascinating and, and rather complicated part about the history of this time period. As, as I mentioned earlier, the, the samurai are largely drawn off the land. In about 85% of the country, uh, so in the other 15%, and these those areas are largely in the peripheries of Japan. Mm-hmm. The samurai um, are allowed to varying degrees to remain living in the countryside. So the the extent and degree to which samurai had any association with the land varied uh, tremendously. Most samurai, the bureaucratic type you were talking about, who were living in the cities, largely were divorced from the land. Um, most of them received stipends, so they just like drawing a salary. Um, some of them, their stipends, in theory, came from a piece of land that uh, was was their fee for kind of a fictive fee. They had no direct ties to that piece of land from which this rice was coming. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, in some cases, in some places, and as I said, largely in the peripheries, some samurai in some places uh, were able to still have some degree of a personal uh, attachment to a particular piece of land, a fief. Uh, they received documents of enfiefment and would visit, not live on that fief, but uh, visit it periodically and uh, would have a direct personal uh, relationship with some of the people with the people living on that fief. Hmm. But in general, the daimyo, the military lords, in drawing the samurai off the land, you know, sought to undercut their authority um, as landholders and, and, and thus to, to make them dependent on the lord by, by undercutting that independent authority and ties to the land. Hmm. During this period... You know, people often think of Japan, maybe you know, people who haven't studied Japan think of Japan as homogenous, you know, in culture and attitudes, um, you know, now and perhaps in the past, you know, this period that we're discussing. Um, with 260 domains, was Japan a lot more diverse than people might think, you know, culturally or, you know, attitudes towards different things? Yes, uh, very much so. And um, actually, my uh, book that I, in which I first started writing about the samurai, the tour of duty, one one of the themes there is how the system of alternate attendance uh, functioned to, in a sense, to create a kind of unified 
national culture in Japan um, because these samurai were coming every other year to the capital from their individual domains and bringing with them their distinct cultures and ways of speaking um, and bringing that culture to this, uh, the center, to Edo, and then bringing back culture from the center to back to their localities. Um, so there's that element of cultural um, diversity. There's also diversity I found in terms of, even in terms of um, martial customs. For example, some domains uh, seem to prize um, the uh, horse riding more than others. Um, some domains in the northeast and, and also one in the southern island of Shikoku where I did a lot of my research, a domain called Tosa, where they had, um, for example, a curious custom of uh, a horse riding ceremony every year on the 11th day of the new year in which each of the samurai had to ride on horseback um, at full throttle down the main drag in front of the castle a uh, distance of almost a thousand meters, mm-hmm. and this was, you know, them exhibiting their uh, uh, ability to to ride effectively. And uh, halfway down the this stretch, they had to turn and and bow to the Lord, and try not to fall off the horse. <laughs> and there's some instances uh, in, in which they were not successful and, and fell off, and so. A, a samurai in war in wartime who fell off his horse, according to the laws of this domain, would be demoted. So it brought great shame if you fell off your horse, and uh, particularly when the lord, his advisors, and even commoners were allowed to view on one end of this horse riding course. Mm-hmm. But um, this case I'm talking about is the only one that I've discovered so far. So I I, I guess that's, that's an example of uh, a local. Uh, diversity in, in custom. Mm-hmm. How many entries? About how many entries does the book have? Uh, there, there is over a hundred, a hundred and three entries. Mm-hmm. There are also um, more than thirty sidebars. Well, sidebars are a place where I put kind of interesting, odd information, kind of eclectic information that I thought would be of interest to the reader. Mm-hmm. And the entries—they're not short ones. They're they're pretty extensive, I guess. In general, there are a thousand words or more. Mm-hmm. A few that are are shorter, but uh, and there's some that are are longer. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, let's turn towards how you did your research. Now, you said you've been researching this subject for quite a while. Um, what sort of resources um, have you used for your for the research on this book and, and your other works that I guess feed into this? Sure, thank you. Um, well, uh, documents, of course, issued by both the central government of the Tokugawa, the shogunate, as well as those of uh, the local uh, domains. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Toso Domain, the domain I mentioned in the context of the horse riding festival, was uh, one that I particularly focused on because they had a uh, tremendous run of documents for the entire duration of the Tokugawa period. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used uh, diaries written by samurai, I uh, also, uh, you know, of course, many secondary sources, um, online sources, material from uh, museum exhibitions in the United States and in Japan, and a lot of information from historic sites uh, in Japan, uh, castles, castle museums, mm-hmm. some high residences, uh, shrines and temples affiliated with the ruling governments, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. As far as archives, was it mostly, is there a national archive, or did were there many local archives that, that you've used? Had... There, there is, a, of course, like a equivalent of Library of Congress, the National Diet Library. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tended to use more uh, uh, prefectural libraries mm-hmm. and um, local city libraries. And are many of the documents, are they original, or have they been... Um, transposed or, or uh, photographed, or do you have microfiche? How, how does that work? Uh, fortunately, microfiche um, <laughs> is a thing of, of the past. Many, many <laughs> uh, museums <laughs> and libraries are digitizing, but um, I have a lot of material that um, collected going back to the 90s that are simply Xerox copies. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so, some are printed documents, transposed, as you said, or transcribed. Um, some are uh, brush-written documents that I was uh, fortunately able to uh, either photograph or photocopy. How about uh, artifacts? Have you? Uh, are there any interesting artifacts you've come across from the period that, that you might want to mention? Oh, um, sure. Um, uh, some are uh, helmets and are, are fascinating. Um, Japanese uh, uh, tsuba, the sword guards, are, are fascinating. The, the helmets in particular, um, I, I've, I've written about, I haven't published on it yet, except in, in the encyclopedia, but um, in a, partic a particular kind or class of helmets that are called um, uh, kawari kabuto or uh, unusual helmets. These are helmets that were created um, very decorative in form. Some are in uh, shapes of, of uh, anim animate objects or uh, animals, mm -hmm. or even in some cases, a couple of ca unusual cases, vegetables, <laughs> uh, uh, eggplant shaped helmet, um, a dragonfly, uh, shaped helmet, a rabbit ear shaped helmet. And so th these are important. I think, um, they, they, they help to, to, uh, disprove sort of the stereotypes about samurai as only being, uh, fixated on death. Um, the, the eggplant is a, a symbol of uh, kind of a fertility and of abundance. Hmm. And, and um, sometimes samurai would have helmets uh, in the shape of the uh, god of longevity. So that goes completely against this notion that samurai, you know, were anxious to die and fixated on death. Hmm. So uh, there's a lot of humor, I, I find, and um, you know, human interest in, in these uh, in helmets that kind of defy the stereotype of the samurai as a, you know, cold, um, aloof uh, figure fixated on death. Now, during, because the Tokugawa period was so peaceful, do you find that the, um, you know, the armor and the weapons, uh, as far as their, their quality, their artistry, um, their effectiveness, do you, are you able to comment on, um, did it get better or worse during this period? Did peace make these items less less important to the to the samurai or did they become more important since that's what they had to show you know their prowess right. or whatever the, the armor becomes i think more important in terms of status and ref, you know uh, as a reflection of status mm -hmm. for most of the uh, tokugawa period now again late, late in the period when the japanese are feeling highly pressured by Western ships intruding in Japanese waters. We see a, re a return to a, a uh, concern with more with the, the quality of armor and a return to older styles uh, that predate the Tokugawa period. Hmm. And, and as far as the weapons, too, are they, do they, you know, swords are a big thing. You know, obviously people are interested in samurai. The sword is the big thing. Uh, do, you, do you know if swords... You know, what was the quality and artistry of swords during this period? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert in uh, swords by any means. Um, uh, they remain highly value, valued and their lineages are, are traced, th those of the, uh, the most uh, famous famous swords. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's a, any uh, diminution in the quality of, uh, of swords, certainly. Um, you know, after Westerners come to Japan, the samurai are, are greatly feared by them as as warriors, and there you know a number of incidents of conflict between uh, samurai and and the, the Westerners. I'm sorry, just to make sure I understood that you're saying there was so when when Westerners would show up, there would be um, yeah, how much conflict what was there? Because I I noticed noted instances mm -hmm. uh, that I was reading in your book. Um, you know, of Westerners showing up and trying to force their way into ports and that sort of thing. Um, how much conflict did that result in, or was it more a show of force and then, you know, the Westerners backed off? Well, there were, there, there were, you know, not, not a lot, but there were a number of, there were instances in, in which conflict, um, occurred and samurai attacked, uh, Westerners, um, uh, famous one in, in, in 1862 where a British merchant was, uh, 
literally ha hacked to pieces for getting in the way, um, it, it's believed getting in the way of the procession of the uh, mighty lord of uh, Satsuma domain. Mm -hmm. uh, there, late, after 1863, uh, there's some, there's an anti uh, foreigner movement and there are uh, some attacks on the foreign legations of the Western powers and um, there's some instances when uh, uh, of uh, interpreters and aides of, of the Western diplomats being uh, attacked and, and either wounded or, or, or killed. Um, so there were a handful of these, um, but you know since since they uh, happened, they, they received a lot of attention and n notoriety. Mm -hmm. Did the Tokugawas engage? Um, so obviously they reformed Japanese society. Or in the sense they they changed it to achieve the peace they um, they created. Was there much modernization apart from that, or was it basically did the Meiji's have to come in and force the modernization that um, Japan needed to deal with Western powers? Right. The sort of the, the 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 pressure felt from the Western powers, you know, beginning uh, in in the the nineteenth uh, century when when Western uh, uh, whaling ships, you know, begin intruding in Japanese waters with more frequency. You know, begins to alert the Japanese to the the need to uh, to Im improve their defenses and, and to improve their martial abilities. Um, so, in the late Tokugawa, you see a lot of emphasis on uh, sword training, training with a, a sword again, and uh, more more attention to modernizing to um, Casting cannon and and building uh, Western style gunships. To a large extent, this was done through the use of uh, Western uh, texts that were uh, translated. So the Japanese were able to build, for example, a uh, a steamship. You know, before they've even uh, seen one. Is that I noted a term? Uh, they created something. What was it, the Office of the Analysis of Barbarian Books or something like that? Right, right. Great title. Right? <laughs> Basically, that, that that was a a, a school or office created by the central government um, to advance the the study of Western technology. Mm -hmm. But uh, even before the shogunate established that school, some of the individual domains, um, particularly the ones that were on the coast in the south, and and felt the Western threat more. Um, strongly, they they began experimenting uh, with Western technology much uh, sooner before the Tokugawa did. Hmm. Obviously, you enjoy the subject, but is there a part of the research you find you found most enjoyable? Uh, well, um, you know, traveling, doing research with my feet, <laughs> uh, visiting the different um, historic um, uh, locations, the the former castle towns and you know, walking through the streets in towns where there's still a substantial number of old samurai homes uh, remaining, a uh, place like Hagi uh, in southern Japan in, in particular, um, you know, being able to, to walk uh, and into these homes and, and to uh, kind of experience uh, a little bit of what uh, life might have been like. Um, I always fi find that uh, enjoyable. What? For this particular book, was there anything you found that most surprised you? Not really. Um, nothing ter terribly, uh, I, I guess m maybe I'm inured to, to surprise after <laughs> studying the subject um, uh, for so long. But um, no, there, there are always surprises. Like I, I was walking around uh, again in the city of, of Hagi and came across a small temple um, that in, in which... Um, uh, it, it honored the loyal cat of a retainer of the Lord. <laughs> uh, so the, this was a story of a retainer of the Lord of this domain of Hagi. Um, when the retainer died, his loyal cat t wouldn't leave his master's graveside. And on the 49th day of mourning, the cat killed himself by biting its tongue out in grief. So, you know, coming across this kind of story, uh, you know, is one of the surprises of, of research and just, you know, goes to show you how 
much of the people of this time period prized loyalty and even, you know, projected this onto their animals. Mm -hmm. So cats were popular in Japan? Well, in this instance, sure. And, and there are other, you know, stories of loyal cats uh, that don't have anything to do with samurai, but... Because uh, <laughs> hmm. that's one of the, one of those little side, like, um, how would I put it, uh... You know, the, the things that add color to society, like pets. You know, what sort of pets did samurai like to keep? Um, sure. Uh, dogs as well. Um, although early in the in the 17th century, samurai actually ate dogs. Hmm. But then <laughs> they... Seems to have died out um, by mid, mid-century. mid but... hmm. Any particular dogs that they um, like to keep? Well, um, the the... Some of the, the dogs introduced by the Westerners became prized as um, like as exotic pets by some of the daimyo. You can see uh, late in the period some uh, woodblock prints of them. Mm -hmm. What sort of um, do you know what breeds? I, I couldn't be specific. Um, some some one that I'm picturing in my mind kind of looks like a uh, a, a whippet or um, kind of a, a slender kind of racing type dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. For this period, for the to Tokugawa period, is there um, a p particular question that you've looked into that you find very difficult to come to a conclusion on, or that's just taken a while for you to come to a conclusion on? Well, um, I guess the, the, the question, I, I sort of touched on it in a way in in, in um, discussing the, uh, the right of, the uh, formal right of samurai to kill an offending uh, commoner, mm -hmm. uh, but because there are no central archives and e each domain had its own way of collecting records, it's a very fragmented historical uh, record. So, um, you know, the question, you know, how, how vi violent a society was it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how often did samurai have to resort to violence? That, that's a uh, interesting question that I, that um, I think um, you know it, it, it will require individual studies of every domain and, and even then you know because of the incompleteness of the record one one really could never probably come to a resolution of that mm -hmm. i don't want to give the uh, Im impression that that samurai just went around and, and killed commoners who uh you know happened to say something nasty towards them or uh the um uh, those instances uh, did occur when um you know, samurai might be bumped by a commoner or um, verbally insulted or cheated. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, lords discouraged the samurai from exercising private uh, justice. Mm -hmm. And so there are inter some interesting cases in which a samurai's right to cut down an offending commoner was at first, you know, um, up upheld, but then over time, um, much much later, perhaps the samurai was uh, was um, shown that uh, display the lord's displeasure, perhaps being um, uh, relieved of his office, or in some cases even banished mm -hmm. for for not having justifiable uh, reason in in killing a, a commoner. That actually um, that reminds me of a question I had, which is or or a comment maybe, which is that the samurai at this time seemed more like an internal police force than um than a military force in a sense that they they just made sure people did as they were supposed to you know within society well because the society was so you know well structured and the samurai did have a monopoly on the use of violence um you know uh, early in the period in particular westerners noted how orderly japan was even in the countryside where there was no um, visible evidence of samurai. Hmm. Uh, so I think that that's one of the notable um, features of of the society. You know, while, while there wasn't uh, weren't occasions until late in the period for samurai to really uh, you know engage in in battle, the alternate attendance was viewed as a kind of military service. The movements, the military movements of large numbers of men from the home domain to Edo and back. Mm -hmm. Was there? Did the samurai and daimyo act as sort of the um, the judge, ju you know, the investigators, the police force for their territories, or did they maintain, uh, or was there another 
did they have another um um way of doing that of managing you know petty crime or murder or anything like that well justice was administered sort of separately according to status the samurai um you know had their own s- separate uh justice system Co- commoners um were were judged by uh, s- samurai uh, officials but according to different um different different laws mm-hmm. And so who would the, so were the samurai judged, um, did the shogun judge samurai or was that handled at the, at the, uh, daimyo level? Right. Only, only c- cases that, um, involved legal disputes across the main borders were, um, uh, adjudicated by the shogun's court. Mm-hmm. Individual samurai would be subject to the, um, the, the laws and the, the, the legal process um, it, within their own uh, domain. Mm-hmm. Was the legal process very formalized and followed, or was it more of a um, whatever the daimyo felt like doing as punishment kind of thing? No, I mean, there, there were, um, I mean, there's certain uh, expectations of uh, of samurai that, and um, of course, the ultimate recourse for a, a samurai who would, you know, brought shame to his uh, family mm-hmm. would, would be to commit um, uh, ritual suicide. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing, you know, nothing formalized, nothing written down. Was it more sort of like um, rules that were understood? In in terms of the, the, the samurai, well, there, there were, you know, codes of, of behavior and regulations, but there wasn't a clear legal code that if you do this, then that's going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even as a warrior class, I don't know, I'm just, it, maybe I'm being too modern in my thinking, you know, I'm thinking of the U S <laughs> with its UCMJ. There's no, the summer I didn't have any considering it was such a bureaucratic society. I guess there still didn't exist a, uh, sort of a reference, so to speak of, and I'm not talking about like major infractions, you know, maybe small ones that might occur. Right. I mean, th- there were st- statutes like for fines, you know, for, for guards if they fell asleep on duty or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but but not a uh, kind of strict um, en- enunciation of uh, of more serious crimes and, and, and what the punishments of them w- would be. Mm-hmm. Uh, ban- banishment. Well, th- there are different um, degrees of punishment, I should say. Um for sort of light light infractions and the uh, um, ha- house arrest or domiciliary confinement, um, banishment obviously would be a, a, a severe form of punishment. Mm-hmm. And then for more serious disobeying of laws, the uh, the loss of samurai status. Mm. Yeah. One one particular samurai that I'm writing about in my a new new project, a man named Yoshida Shoin. Um, he decides to leave his domain and travel up north and, uh, without bothering to wait for the official, uh, letter of permission to come. And, and he is punished with, um, loss of samurai status. Hmm. He gets it back later because the Lord likes him, but, uh, for <laughs> a 10 year period, he is technically a, you know, not, not a samurai. <laughs> And then what you just, uh, did he sit around and just drink or how, how does he spend his time he, after that? He, well, he did what he, he traveled, uh, around the country. Um, he was, um, a man who was, you know, deeply disturbed by the foreign, uh, threat, uh, in Japanese waters. And so he traveled around, particularly up north where Western ships were being seen with some frequency in the 1850s, mm-hmm. uh, and, and 18, yeah, the early 1850s, um, and and you know wanted to survey conditions and and see what was going on uh, in the country. Sounds like a really interesting book um, to read once you complete it. I hope so. So, what do you? So, apart from simply informing uh, readers about this period, what do you hope the book will do? Well, uh, as an encyclopedia, I, I you know I'm hopeful that it will be a, a useful reference. Mm-hmm. Um, Kind of a, a go-to book for people that might um, want to look something up in particular about the samurai, um, but also each um, entry has a, uh, a a list of references, and these are uh, 
overwhelmingly almost almost totally uh, sources in the English language. So uh, I would give uh, helpful hints on on where to look for people that that want to know more about a, a particular uh, subject. Mm-hmm. Did you have any difficulties um, getting the book uh, finished? I know you uh, said pa- ABC Clio was searching for for someone, and they they brought you on to write the book for them. Correct. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, nothing unusual, just the usual um, life of an academic trying to balance uh, hmm. academic um, work with, with teaching and, and writing. They were pretty flexible in uh, giving me enough time uh, to do it right. Okay. And by the reviews, it seems that you did it right. So, uh, Thank you. Where can people find uh, your work, this book and, and other books that, uh, that you've worked on, or even other papers or, or whatnot? Or do you have your own website or any kind of uh, a personal website people can go to 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 learn more about your works? I do have one set up for um, one of the books that I uh, have written, The Voices of Early Modern Japan, which is a collection of documents um, on the period with annotations. It includes many on the samurai. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a website set up for that, um, Voices of Early Modern Japan dot com. Okay. Um, but this book is, um, as you know, published by ABC Clio. They only they, they tend to cater to libraries and and um, so they they don't publish in paper. So I'm I'm, I'm uh, I have the paperback rights and I'm going to try and publish it in paper and make it more widely uh, accessible. Okay. Amazon page, just to answer your question, um, Amazon author page with all uh, of my uh, books listed there. Okay. All right. That's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? No, uh, just, uh, just to mention that the, the, the project I'm working on now is called, uh, Sword and Brush, mm-hmm. Port- Portraits of Samurai Life in Early Modern Japan. And it, it, it's a collection of 14 biographies mm-hmm. of, uh, famous and as well as less well known, uh, samurai coming from different parts of the country and representing, uh, different ranks of uh, within the samurai hierarchy, so I'm uh, excited uh, by that. And I'm also working on a uh, collaborating with Ted Ed on an animated story uh, based based in history on the life of a samurai. So that that should be out in a couple months. Okay, cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you for speaking with me. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts, either good or bad. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, on Facebook at warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at War Scholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. If you like to read, don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thank you.